Hello, everybody. I want you to greet the people around you and tell them I'm happy you're here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. How many of you believe that you, we, you and I, we worship a God of miracles? Amen. You believe in that? Hallelujah. Everybody say that. God is a God of miracles. Tell someone beside you, you worship a God of miracles. I received a, a number of emails and a number of text messages all through these past days since the Kerygma conference and they're telling me how blessed and how changed and how healed they are because of the conference. It's just amazing how many people have been so blessed. And I'll give you two text messages I received yesterday. One of them was telling, telling me that she had a cyst in the liver. She went to her doctors at Medical City and the doctors could not find the cyst anymore. And there's another woman, a friend of mine, she, she, had, she had cancer somewhere, I, I forget where, but she goes to her doctors and she was texting me right that moment when she was in front of the doctor because the doctor said, I cannot find whatever, whatever we found there. Everybody say, God is a God of miracles. God is a God of miracles. And I believe that the God that healed and blessed in the Kerygma Conference is here right now. You believe me? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let's pray our novena to God's love with all our hearts. Everybody say, Today I receive all of God's love for me. Today I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today I open myself to your blessings, healing, and miracles. Today I open myself to God's Word so that I become more like Jesus every day. Today I proclaim that I'm God's beloved, I'm God's servant, and I'm God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I will bless the world. Amen. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Father God, I pray that you speak to us today. Brothers and sisters, we're going to read from Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 9. We're going to read the story of the conversion of Paul. Most of you know Paul and he was Saul before the conversion. Let's read that. Let's be nourished by the Word of God together. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, and when he opened his eyes, he was blind. Say that with me, blind. Go on. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days. Say that with me, blind for three days. Go on. And did not eat or drink. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. Say Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision calling, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem and he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name but the Lord said go 
For Saul is my chosen instrument. Say that with me. Chosen instrument. Oh, that's beautiful. To take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. How many of you understand this? When, 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 when Ananias said, you will regain your sight, he was not only talking about physical sight. Uh-huh. He was talking about what? The sight of the heart, our spiritual sight. Paul was going to see Jesus. Go on. Instantly, something like scales fell from the soul size, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food, regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days, and immediately he began ab preaching about Jesus in the... Say, immediately. Tell someone beside you, immediately. We're going to talk about that later, but that word is so important. Immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Place both hands over your chest. Pray with all your heart. Say after me, Jesus. 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 You are the source of my life. You are the center of my life. You are my number one. You are my Lord. And I ask you that you get a grip of my soul and not let go. Speak to me and I will obey. I will do your will by the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for bringing me to this place of miracles. Amen. Amen. If you believe God is here, give Him a big hand and love Him and honor Him and praise Him and honor Him. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. How many of you expect a miracle today? Raise your hand. Everybody say Amen. amen. You know what Amen means? Amen is in Hebrew, Amenu, which means I agree. Every time you say amen, you're saying, I agree. Amen. Not only that, there's a second meaning to, to the Hebrew word amenu. It means to be nourished. Meaning you say, I'm nourished. When you say amen, you're saying, I'm nourished. All right. Amen. 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 Let's give the Lord a big hand. God is good. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's all be seated. And tell someone beside you, God will speak to you today. Slap him hard on the back and say, you better listen. Amen. Can I tell you a joke? Can I? Be sure to laugh. There were two camels, a mama camel and a baby camel, and both of them are charismatic. Both of them attend the feast. And the baby camel talks to the mommy camel, Mommy, why do I have long eyelashes? And the, and the mommy camel says, Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's good you asked. You see, God called us and God made us for the journey. And when you're walking in the journey in the desert, there's sandstorms. And the long eyelashes protect your eyes. And the baby camel says, Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, mommy. Mommy, I have another question. Why do I have long legs? And the mommy camel says, Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, baby. You know, baby camel, you've got long legs because when you're in the journey, say journey. journey. When you're in the journey and your, your long legs, they sink on the desert sands, you can still walk. Hallelujah, mommy. Hallelujah, baby. Mommy, I've got a third question. Why do we have humps on our back? And the mom, mommy camel says, oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, baby. You know what? When you're in the journey, say journey. We're in your journey and you don't have water in the desert. We've got our own water. And we carry 40 gallons of water. And we will never dry up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, mommy. Hallelujah, baby. Mommy, I've got a last question. What is it, baby? Mommy, if we have long lashes for the journey 
And we've got long legs for the journey. And we've got humps in the back for the journey. Why are we in a zoo? (laughs) Everybody say zoo. 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 You're supposed to be in the journey, but you're in the zoo. God has given you equipment. Say equipment. God gave the camel equipment, long eyelashes, long legs, humps in the back for water. God gave that camel equipment for the long journey, but the, the camel is not taking the journey. Many people are like that. Saul was like that. Paul was like that. He was, he was putting Christians in prison. He hated Christians. He hated Christians so much, he wanted to murder them. He never killed a Christian, but murder was in his heart. And he approved the murder of Christians. And what he did was he, he got orders from the high priest of Jerusalem. And, and, and he, he said, I'm, I'm going to put... He was in the zoo when God wanted him to be in the journey. God, you know, Paul had so much equipment. He had passion. He had intelligence. He was, he was a man of, of learning and knowledge. He, he, was, he, was, he had equipment. But he was in the zoo. He was in plan A. Say plan A. He was in plan A when God had a plan B. And you know what? For Paul to move from the zoo to the journey. For Paul to move from plan A to plan B. God had to come and wake him up. And on the road to Damascus, a light shone. And the light was so brilliant and he was so shocked, he fell off the horse. Have you ever fallen from a horse before? No one? Oh, one person over there. Painful? Incredibly painful? You know what? You're so shocked. You fall on the, from the horse. And then he got blinded. You know what? Sometimes God will do that for you. I'm going to tell you three stories today. The first one is Paul. Say Paul. The second person I'm going to share with you, there are three stories. The, th- the second person is, is a man by the name of Calixtus. Say Calixtus. Do you know Calixtus? That's good. You, you don't know him? You sure? Absolutely? That's good. He lived in the year 190. Calixtus was a Christian slave. Say slave. slave. He had a master who was also a Christian. His name was Carpophorus. Say that. Wow. I couldn't get it for the, for the first seven times. I mean, I was a carpo, 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 carpophorus. Carpophorus was a, was, a, was, a, was a good man. And he wanted to put up a bank. This happened in the Roman Empire, okay? 190 AD. He, he wanted to put up a bank for his fellow Christians, especially for the widows, the Christian widows, who had very little money. And he wanted to make it secure and make it grow for them. What Carpophorus did, and this was a tragedy, he asked his slave, Calixtus, who had some experience with money, to run the bank for him. Big mistake. Because Calixtus, number one, he invested the money in terrible places that, that basically it lost. And number two, Calixtus, listen to me, was a thief. Calixtus was a Christian, but he was also a thief. How many of you know that even if you're a Christian, you can become a thief? Uh huh. Uh huh. How many of you understand that in the Philippines our government are filled with Catholics and Christians? Uh huh. Okay. So Calixtus was managing this bank, stealing money from the bank for his own needs. And so a day came when there was no more money in the bank, and poor Christians who, who invested their money there, they lost all, all their wealth. And Calixtus ran away, escaping. And he went to the harbor and he rode a boat. This is like an action movie, really. You know, this is so well documented by the historians. You, you know the details of the story. Calixtus was in a boat and he was escaping when Carco- Carpophorus, his master, was running after him in a small little, little tiny boat, you know. And so when, 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 when Calixtus saw his master running after him, he jumped to the sea. And then Car- Car- Carpophorus said, catch that guy, he's a thief. And so the sailors jumped after Calixtus and then brought him to the mast, his master. And 
and, and Carco, Carpophorus, these are terrible names, Carpophorus, Car, Carpophorus they, they, they brought him in chains, he brought him in chains, and you did, during the Roman Empire, a master can do anything whatsoever with a slave, okay, anything whatsoever. So, so Carpophorus condemned Calixtus to work uh, in hard, brutal, back-breaking labor. He actually condemned them to work in a stone wheel. Say stone wheel. You know what a stone wheel is? I'll tell you what it is. It's a wheel made of stone. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm astounded by my intelligence. I mean, now for 16 hours a day, 16 hours, Calixtus would roll this wheel. It was brutal labor. And Calixtus thought that he would die there. But then something happened. You know what happened? Ask me what? The Christians who invested in the bank, they came to the, to, to, they went to uh, Carpophorus and said, what are you doing with your slave? You know, don't punish him anymore. Maybe if you release him, he might get a little bit of our money back. And so Carpophorus released Calixtus and said, on the condition that you will maybe try, try to get a little bit of the money back. You know, Calixtus was not only a thief, he was incredibly foolish. Ask me why. He goes out when he was released, goes to a synagogue, a Jewish church, okay? And in the middle of the service, imagine there's mass going on and a guy comes in right in the middle center and he shouts, give me back my money! Isn't he foolish? You know what, what happened? They threw him to the Roman guards. The Roman guards brought him to court. Guess what? He was sentenced to prison but not an ordinary prison. They brought him to the island of Sardinia to work in the mines. If you think working in a stone wheel is bad, working in the mines in the island of Sardinia is so bad, prisoners will last there for only one year. Because you have to work underground tunnels, there is little oxygen, little food, and little water. And so again, Calixtus, the thief, the embezzler, the prisoner, the troublemaker, was in the island of Sardinia, ready to die. And then a miracle happened. Ask me what miracle? Emperor Commodus, the emperor of Rome. Say this, are you still following me? He had a mistress by the name of Marcia. And Marcia became a Christian. And Marcia, becoming a Christian, goes to the Pope, Pope Victor, and said, I want to do something good. And she says, I heard that there are a group of Christians who, be, who, who went to prison because they're Christians. Are you listening? Just because they're following Jesus, they were brought to prison. And she said, I heard that there's some prisoners, Christian prisoners in the island of Sardinia. Pope, give me a list of those Christian prisoners and I will ask the emperor to release them. So the Pope writes the list. Guess what? He deliberately did not write Calixtus. Why? Because he was a Christian, yes, but he was there not because he was a Christian. He was in prison because he was a he was a thief. So he did not write the name Calixtus in the list. The list goes to Marcia. Marcia brings it to the emperor. The emperor says, released. Guess what? In the island of Sardinia, when all the Christians were being released, you know, calling one by one the names. Calixtus kneels down and says, I'm a Christian too. I'm a Christian too. Release me, release me. I'm not in the list, but I'm a Christian too. And so the guard said, oh, okay, come here. And so they presented the ex-prisoners to the Pope. To the horror of the Pope, he sees Calixtus. What are you doing here? I did not release you. I didn't write your name. You know what? Pope Victor out of wisdom and prudence, he did this. He said, <laughs> he said to Calixtus, I'm going to give you a house and I'm going to pay you even a monthly allowance on one condition, stay out of my life. <laughs> he gave him a house outside the Roman city, far, far away, in the, you know, really far. Just one house, he paid him once a mo uh, every month a monthly allowance. Calixtus, you're to stay there and don't cause any trouble. And what happened to Calixtus in that house was amazing because as he stayed alone there, he had a, a wonderful deepening of his conversion. How many of you understand that? When you get converted, you're supposed to deepen your conversion. 
Amen? You understand that? You get to know Jesus, but it takes a process of getting to know Him more and more. Amen? And so that was, that's what happened to Calixtus. And during that time, as he got, got, got to know the Lord more, he wanted to serve the Lord. And there was this holy priest by the name of Father Zephyrinus. Father Zeph. Let's call him Father Zeph. Father Zeph, he, you know, Calixtus became his sacristan, altar boy, house boy, assistant, you know, just serving the priest. And this is what happened. Remember Pope Victor? He died. And when he died, Father Zephyrinus became the Pope. And the first thing he did, are you listening to me? This gets exciting. The first thing he did was to ordain his houseboy. <laughs> so Calixtus the thief, Calixtus the embezzler, Calixtus the troublemaker becomes Father Zephyrinus. Are you with me? But by that time that he became a priest, everyone in, in, in Rome, the Christians in Rome, now know him no longer as a thief because they were so amazed by the transformation of his life that they knew him now as a holy man. And then something happened. Remember Father Zephyrinus that became Pope Zephyrinus? He died. And when he died, the Christians of Rome elected a new Pope, Pope Calixtus. I love that story. You love that story? I, I, I love that story. And I was reading Saul, the murderer, to Paul, the apostle, and I was saying, I've got to tell the story of Calixtus. You know why? Calixtus the Pope had only five years of, of being in charge of the church. Five years as Pope. And during those five years, he was known for only one thing. You want to know what? Tell me what. He was known for mercy. He was known for mercy. You know, when, when, when the, the Pope, when, when he would meet an adulteress, he would say, come, repent. Oh, he, he, you know, other Christians, oh, adulteress, and oh, heretic, and oh, evil person, and oh, sinner. You know, the Pope Calixtus, come, repent of your sins. Come back to Jesus. Come back. He had mercy because one... I was reading Saul, the murderer, to Paul, the apostle, and I was saying, I've got to tell the story of Calixtus. You know why? Calixtus the Pope had only five years of, of being in charge of the church. Five years as Pope. And during those five years, he was known for only one thing. You want to know what? Tell me what. He was known for mercy. He was known for mercy. You know, when, when, when the, the Pope, when, when he would meet an adulteress, he would say, come, repent. Oh, he, he, you know, other Christians, adulteress, and oh, heretic, and oh, evil person, and oh, sinner. You know, the Pope Calixtus, come, repent of your sins. Come back to Jesus. Come back. He had mercy because once upon a time, he received mercy. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, you might be saying, you know, from a thief to an embezzler, troublemaker, now he's a priest, and then he became a pope. That's not the end of the story. He was canonized as a saint. And he's now Saint Calixtus to you and me. And, and you know what? Why? From plan A to plan B, from zoo to journey, what, what woke him up? For Paul, from Paul. And, and that's number two. My point of number, number one is that God has a vision for your life. Say that with me. God has a vision for your life. Say that with me. God has a vision for my life. He, he, he has a plan for, for your life. He, he wants you to do certain things for His kingdom. And they're great things. But here's number two. For you to, to, to move to plan B. Number two says God will find a way to... Catch your attention. Say that with me. Catch your attention. Catch your attention. Many of you are still in the zoo. Many of you are working on plan A. God wants you to move into plan B. You know what? It's going to catch your attention. For Paul, it was a sunstroke. Not S-U-N, but S-O-N. It was a sunstroke and he fell off his horse. For, for Calixtus, it was the island of Sardinia, almost dying in an underground tunnel. When he, he, was, he, was, he was struck by the power of God and, and, and he said, I, I want to repent. I want to repent. I'll give you my third story. My first story is Paul. 
My second story is Calixtus. And my third story is a young man that came to me many, many years ago. A stocky fellow, huge, huge body, you know, big guy, rough and rugged man. He came to me in a prayer meeting and he said, Brother Bo, can you pray over me? And he says, he starts telling him, talking about his life. He says, you know, I'm a, I take drugs and I'm an alcoholic. I drink a lot. Uh, I go around with loose women. And Brother Bo, I'm sick. I'm sick. And then I say, what kind of sickness? I feel pains in my body. I went to the doctor already, and the doctor says, he doesn't see anything wrong with me. And then he says, Brother Bo, I think I'm being cursed. In Tagalog, kinukulam ako ng isang mangkukulam. I'm being cursed. You know what I told him? Oh, that's easy. That's easy. And he said, why? We'll just pray for you. I put my hand over his head and I said, in Jesus' name, I go against any evil that's, that's going against your body right now. And I said, your problem is solved. Just like that, just like that. You know, brothers and sisters, the pains in his body left him. Left him just like that. And you know, he started going to the prayer meeting and this young man started serving the Lord. He started serving God and he told me, I want to serve God. I want to serve God. His name, may, maybe some of you know him, his name is Jodine Sola. And Jodine Sola is now serving God full time in He Cares Foundation. It's a foundation he built for street children. And, and he would minister to street children. He does so many things. I'm, I'm going to later on, I'm going to tell you what he does. But, but look at this man. From someone who did, was far away from God. He was in the zoo. He was in plan A. God said, that's not my vision for your life. Amen? God says, I have, a, I have something else. I want you to do something for my kingdom. And you know what woke him up? Ask me what? Mangkukulam. Right? He was sick. If he was not sick, he would not go to that prayer meeting and ask for a prayer. But because he was sick, he drove him. How many of you know this? That when God catches your attention, sometimes He allows disaster problems. Sometimes it's a broken relationship. You have such this broken relationship in desperation. You cry out to God. And from plan A, you go to plan B. Amen? Some of, some of you, it's a business failure. Some of you, it's a sickness. Whatever it is, God catches your attention and says, Stop staying in the zoo. I've given you equipment to go to the journey. Amen? Amen. Are you listening to me? Yeah. Are you listening to what God is telling you? Yeah. Tell someone beside you, surrender to God. Tell someone beside you, surrender to his vision. Tell someone beside you, wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Let's go on. I, I, I'm going to read you this verse. The verses that we read a while ago, because this is very important. Very, very important. He says here, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? And then the voice replied, I am Jesus. I am Jesus. The men, you know, here's this. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Listen, now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Say that with me, and you will be told what you must do. Here's, here's, here's number three. Number three. God will reveal His vision one step at a time. Say that with me. God will reveal His vision one step at a time. You understand that? When you say yes to God, God will not say, this is what will you do two years from now, this is what you will do five years from now, this is what you will do ten... No, God's going to say, this is what you're going to do now. One step. What you're going to do later on, forget about it. I'll tell you when the time comes. When Paul said yes to him in the road to Damascus and in Damascus itself, guess what? Paul never knew he was going to be the greatest missionary in the church. Paul never knew that he was going to write 7 to 13 epistles in the New Testament. Paul never knew that. He just said yes to the Lord. Calixtus, when he said yes to God, would never knew he was going to become Pope. Yes? Jodine, when he said yes to God, never knew that one day he will have an incredible ministry for street children, that he would be feeding 300 street children a week. He would be sending 750 street children to school. Jody never knew that he would have a micro-lending program in six slum areas. He never knew that he would have a housing project for the families of street children numbering 120 houses. Jody never knew all of that. He said, he just said yes to God. And then God brought him one step at a time. Say that with me, one step at a time. 
Hold the hand of the person beside you. Please. Look that person in the eye and tell that person, tell that person, great things are coming. That you do not know yet. You, you do not know the great things that God will do in your life. But one step at a time is going to reveal to you. You got me? Let me go on. The men with Saul stood speechless. For they heard the sound of someone's voice but saw no one. Saul picked himself up the ground. But when he opened his eyes, he was blind. Say blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. Read, read with me. Read with me this line. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Here's number four. I just want to say this to you. God wants you to spend time alone with Him when He reveals His vision. Read that for me, please. God wants you to spend time alone with Him when He reveals. Paul was blind for three days, did not eat or drink in the presence of God. Calixtus was in the island of Sardinia, underground tunnels. And then Pope Victor, when he was released, brought him into a house far away, alone in a, in a house, communing with God. Jodine Sola, he, we, 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 we lived together in one house for five years. And I had the honor of, the, the, the honor of, of, of discipling him for, for five years. And we would pray two hours a day every morning for five years, you know. If God, if you want to understand the vision that God has for your life, do, do, you under, do you want to understand? Do you want to clarify that in your mind, what God wants you to do? You want, you want that? Then spend a few days doing nothing else but being in the presence of God. And please do that before this year ends. You've got a lot of things to do next year. God wants you to build His kingdom next year. God wants you to share His light next year. God wants you to do great things next year. Stay alone in the presence of God for a few days. Are you listening? I mean, I know it's a busy season. And I know there's a lot of parties going on. But you spend time in the presence of God. You hear me? You hear me? Tell someone beside you, listen to Bo. Put it in your calendar. Put it in your calendar. Just, just be alone. Just, just go do two, three days. Be, be, be like Paul, blind. And, 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 and commune with God. And ask Him, Lord, what do you want me to do next year? What's your vision for my life? What's my... Let me go on. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord spoke to him in a vision calling, Ananias! Yes, Lord. And the Lord said, go over to Straight Street and into the house of Judas. And, and, and it goes on. But Lord exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man... Brothers and sisters, Paul was a man of passion. Even before his conversion, he was a man of passion. He, he, he wanted to imprison Christians. And this is what I'm going to share with you now. God wants, I'm sorry, God will use the same gifts you used for evil to fulfill His vision. Say that with me. You understand me? Do you understand that? Paul had so much passion. He was a passionate man. And, and he was going about imprisoning Christians that same, say same passion. That same passion, when he got converted, used it now for the glory of God, to preaching the gospel of Jesus. Did you get that? Adrian Panganiban, he's, he was leading worship a while ago. Did you hear his voice? Did you understand? And do you, do, do you appreciate that voice? He was using it for the world before, and now he's using it for the kingdom of God. Whatever gifts you have, a long time ago, your money, you used it for yourself. Now you're going to use it for the kingdom of God. You hear me? Your time, your talents, you used it for the world before, God's going to use it for the kingdom of God. Calixtus, he stole money. Now he was stealing souls from the devil because of his mercy. Jodine Sola. You know, when I was living with Jodine for five years, 
I could never understand why God created such a tough man. Rugged, strong, you know, built like a wrestler. Tough. He was so tough. I'll tell you how tough he was. You know, we were living together and, and he was chopping wood. And when he was chopping wood, he hit his thumb. And, and his thumb, you know, had this big, huge cut. Not, not everything fell off, but just, just a bit, you know, just a big slice. And you know what Jodine did? He got a needle and he got a thread and he disinfected it and he started sewing it by himself. That, that's how tough Jodine is. And, and I'm asking myself, you know, why would God create such a creature? He had, a, he had one time, you know, he, he loves working with his hands. He, would, he, he was a seaman before and he would carry huge, heavy stuff, you know. And I remember he was serving God. Uh, bringing, you know, those speakers, he would carry that single-handedly, you know. He, one time, we were in the house, and he had this big cut here, big cut. He was working with wood and with steel, and he had this big cut. And you know what he did? He got a bottle of alcohol. And he started, you know, I, I hate alcohol and wounds. I, I don't like that. You know, I think it's bad. But anyway, he, was, he, was, he started pouring alcohol in his wound while as he was talking to me, as if nothing is happening. Hi, Bo, you know, I've got this, you know, and it's, that's nothing. That's nothing. Because the next thing he did just blew my mind. And then he, he started pouring alcohol and put down his bottle and then he got a match. Slide it. And he was talking to me and he blew it. Boom. And there was fire all over. And then he got a, a wet rag and just placed it there. And he just kept on talking to me like that, you know? Like, like, like he was eating candy. And I was there just watching him and I said, are you Rambo? I mean, I mean, hi. he was tough. Now guess what? Guess what? When he deals with street children who think they're tough, guess what? They start worshiping Jodine. All those street kids, they worship a tougher guy. You got what I'm saying? The very gifts that Jodine had, which he used for evil, you know, he was a man of the world. He was a drug addict. And he was a... God is now using for his purpose. Amen? There are some of you, you've got gifts and you've got talents and you've got resources and you used it for the world and only for the world. And I'm telling you, God's saying, that's mine. You're going to use it for me. You're going to use it for my purpose. Amen? And here's the final thing, or second to the last thing. I love it. I love it when Ananias came, comes. You know, you know because here's, here's what I want to share with you. God will send angels to help you fulfill this vision. For Paul, it was Ananias. God says, Ananias, go to Paul. No, Lord, that's a scary guy. And, and God says, no, you go there. I, I have a purpose for him. For Calixtus, it was that holy priest, Father Zeph who became Pope Zeph, who, who, was, who was his Ananias. For Jodine, it was me. God, God used me to, to, to be an angel to Jodine. You know, in my life, my parents were my angels. They brought me to a prayer meeting. And then God used a woman by the name of Ida, who prophesied to me, Bo, you're going you're gonna to preach the word. God used his angels. To this day, God sends me angels. Look at your life. I want you to raise both hands up in the air. Just, just say a prayer with me. Say, thank you, Lord, for my angels. I want you to mention their names one by one. Just say, thank you. Thank you for the angels that God has given to me. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much that they brought me closer to you. Hallelujah. Amen. Place your hands up down now. Amen. Thank you, Father. Praise God. Now here's my... Here's my bigger question to you. Is God sending you to be an angel to someone? Go. Go and be an Ananias to another Paul. And you, you don't know what will happen. You know when Jodine came to me and, and I prayed over him and he was telling me that he was this and he was that and he was... I, I didn't know that one day God's going to use him powerfully. Amen? You don't know. You don't know that the people you're talking to and you being an angel to them, you don't know what God will do in that person's life because of your ministry. And the last thing is simply this, number seven. God 
wants you to immediately. Oh, say that word, please. Stand on your feet. Please stand on your feet. Say that word, immediately. Immediately. Act Act. to make his vision vision. a reality. Did you hear me? You don't delay. You know, when, when you have this vision, God is telling you, do this. I'm going to use you in here. Don't delay. Don't say, okay, Lord, I'll do that maybe two years from now. You do it immediately. You, Paul, he preached immediately. And, and, and maybe he, he was not good at it. And, and maybe he was, he was, you know, he had this vague vagueness and a very little knowledge. But you know what? He did it. And, and that's what you and I need to do. Are you ready to pray? Are you ready to submit to God? Maybe some of you have not yet made this lifelong decision to give your life to Jesus. Maybe there are some of you, you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And if you are that person, I want to pray with you. Some of you, you've already made this decision a long time ago to give your life to Jesus. Then let's deepen it and renew your commitment. Amen.